Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the studio and another episode of Vietnam Innovators. This morning, I'm with our guest, John Diddy, the partner and head of ESG at KPMG in Vietnam. Thank you. Great to be here. He's just down the street, so a little quick stroll from his office here to our studio. Thank you for joining the show, John. I know it's busy schedules for all of us, and hopefully it's a great show for you guys listening. Um, John, let's start with you. I understand you've been here for 30 years. Almost. Quite a while. 30 years next year. So 29 and a bit at the moment. Okay. Yeah, it's home for me now. Yeah. My wife's Vietnamese. My children okay. have grown up here. Mm. This is it. Yeah. Fantastic. And in those 30 years, you've been at KBMG for, for 18 of those, I understand. How big has the company like grown and scaled? What are some you know highlights, I think, from that, from that journey, would you say? Every year's been a story of growth for us. Mm. When I joined... Uh, 18 years ago, we had maybe 200 people in Vietnam. Mm. Now we've got offices here in Da Nang and Hanoi. Mm -hmm. We've got perhaps 14, 1500 people. Mm -hmm. It varies a bit. Yep. We have 250 graduates starting next month. Wow. And when I joined the firm, we had less than that in total. So mm. it's been a great story. We've been lucky. Vietnam's grown. We've grown with it. Our clients have grown. Um, every year is a good year. Every year is a good year. And um, those 18 years, what, what, where, where did you start uh, at, the first, at the first year? Where Were you I a partner start? as Goodness. well? Were you? Yeah, I joined the firm as a partner. Okay. I had previously worked with another of the big four accounting firms for mm. a number of years. Okay. Um, and then in 2004, I moved across to KPMG. Okay. And I'm, I'm sure your role has shifted. I mean, I mentioned earlier just now that you're the head of ESG, and we'd love to hear, hear about that a little bit. But wh where did you start in relation to, to where you are now in terms of focus? Over the years, um, I've been the head of our audit practice, I've been the head of our advisory practice, I've been the head of our deal advisory practice. I was the chairman of the firm for a number of years. Okay. I was the quality and risk management partner of the firm for a number of years. And now I've got a, a few different roles. My main role really relates to KPMG's ambition of being the most trusted and trustworthy firm. Mm. And a lot of what we do around trust relates to ESG relates to our purpose, relates to our values. So I spend a lot of my time in that area now. Okay. Don't do much client facing work anymore. My mm -hmm. role is much more um, internal awareness building and you know, supporting the, the practice. Okay. And, and ESG, and for those that don't know, environmental, social, governance. governance. Why is that so important? Does it really does it really help KPMG? You know, when people say that term, I mean, I have my own personal opinion, obviously, but you know, for those listening in uh, that might not be familiar with what ESG is or why it matters, d does it help the Absolutely. bottom line of KPMG? Like, it sounds like a, well, a, a big money how suck. You, you depends on how that. you define bottom line. Yeah. yeah. Um, and look, I, I think for if you go back over history, businesses have been judged as successful based on bottom line, mm. profitability, right. accounting numbers. Mm. I think what's changed over the last probably 15 or 20 years is that capital markets, stakeholders, investors have started to look at ESG, and we would say ESG is a set of factors that need to be looked at if we're assessing what a business contributes to the community, to society, to mm. its shareholders, to its stakeholders. So if you have a business that makes an enormous profit and pays great dividends, people may say, wow, what a great business from an investor's perspective. Mm. But if by doing that, they're not paying fair wages to their staff or they're polluting the environment or they're not behaving in an appropriate manner, mm. that's not a sustainable business for a country. Right. So what ESG is about is looking at the impact that a business has on the community where it operates. Mm -hmm. So I think it's incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And if businesses want to be sustainable, they need to be financially successful, mm -hmm. but they need to be successful from an environmental perspective, from a social perspective, mm -hmm. and from a governance perspective. And are, are the clients of KPMG mirroring kind of that uh, sentiment, would you say? Uh, look, I think some are to different degrees. Mm. I think there are many areas where corporates in Vietnam sometimes lag behind other markets. Mm -hmm. It's just natural. We're a growing market, we're a developing market, businesses here have mm. lots of things to deal with. Certainly what we've been doing a lot of over the last 12 months is around building awareness. It's around helping businesses understand 
why it is important to invest in these sorts of areas, mm. why it does result in a more sustainable business in the longer term. But it does take time for people to build that understanding, build exactly. that awareness. When I moved to Vietnam six years ago, that, that definitely wasn't top of mind for, for most companies unless they were truly global companies coming from uh, the global kind of mandate. Uh, but now we're starting to see Vietnamese companies adopt it themselves um, as well. So it's great to see that progress and I, I hope more to come. Yeah, it is. And again, just one of the, one of the great things about that is mm -hmm. often in Vietnam, regulations have to be in place for companies to react. Mm -hmm. I think the opportunity with ESG is for businesses to get ahead of the regulations. Mm -hmm. ESG is an immediate need. Stakeholders care about it, newspapers talking about it. People who want to work for companies want to work for good companies. Mm. So those Vietnamese companies that can voluntarily adopt great practices, deliver on those and communicate the success of those, they're going to be the winners. Mm -hmm. Well, talking about KPMG, you know, ESG underpins a lot of the values and, and thinking behind and philosophy of KPMG. Could you share for a few more of what those those values are exactly internally, um, and, and maybe some stories to attach those, if possible? It, well, I mean, I, I guess we'd start with our purpose, mm -hmm. um, and we've done a lot of thinking, like a lot of businesses have over the last several years, about why does KPMG exist, and you know, our purpose is to inspire confidence and empower change. That's why all of our people get up and go to work every day. Sometimes they may think I get up and go to work to do auditing or tax advice, mm -hmm. but it is all around inspiring confidence and empowering change. If we do that with our clients, if we do that with regulators, if we do that with our people, Vietnam becomes a better country. So that's what our purpose is. We've got five very simple values, integrity, excellence, courage, together, and for better. And within each of those values, there are a series of sort of bullet points that really set out how we want to be viewed, mm -hmm. how we want our people to behave, the sorts of characteristics we want. If we look at something like courage, uh, it's about being bold and innovative in our thinking. Mm -hmm. So we want people to come to work and challenge how we do things, to challenge John, why are we executing this particular type of work in this way? Isn't there a better way that we can do this? Can we make better use of technology? Can we structure our teams differently? Can we use a different mix of resources? And it's all about helping us to become more sustainable mm -hmm. and helping us to be a better citizen in Vietnam. Yeah. It's, you guys are almost internal consultants for yourselves all the time, bringing fresh new talent, especially the, the youngsters. And yeah, well, look, always, it's, yeah. in, it's very important in the ESG space as well. Mm. We can't go and preach to our clients to do certain things if we're not prepared to do those certain things ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, there's a lot of work that we need to do internally. We're working on things, we're getting better, we're making changes. But the journey to a sustainable business never stops. Mm -hmm. Uh, businesses should never stop having courage. They should never stop innovating. They should never stop looking at how can they create a better experience for the people who work there and for the customers and clients they work with. How do you how do you measure that, especially in context of ESG? You know, it's Tough. it's nice to put um, you know three, five, ten year milestones and, and hope you hit them today because it's a it's a long term goal. How, how do you measure them internally, internally at KPMG? Yeah, look internally. Um, we have something called our impact plan. Mm. And this is how we look at ESG from an internal perspective. And it sits around four pillars. There's a planet pillar, there's people, prosperity and governance. And we have certain metrics in relation to each of those pillars that we've started to capture data on, that we're starting to report on. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're in Vietnam in the formative stage of that, but we're now looking at what are our scope one? What are our scope two? Eventually, not this year, what are our scope three emissions? And we're going to be publishing information on that, making it available and saying to people, here's what we do. Mm -hmm. A big piece for KPMG is around the social pillar because we're a people-based business. Mm -hmm. We're not uh, significant environmental polluters or consumers. We don't use raw materials, we don't manufacture. But for us, it's around what are we doing with our people? What sort of learning and development opportunities are we giving them? How many hours of training per person 
do we provide each year? That's a really important measure for us. Mm -hmm. And if we're not investing in the quality of our people, then we can't deliver the services we want. We look at uh, leadership diversity. What sort of, what's our male, female mix at partner level, manager level, staff level. We look at gender equality from a pay point of view. So we've got a whole series of internal metrics mm -hmm. that we look at and say, what actions can we take to improve on these? Okay. Different businesses, different standards. I mean, the whole world of ESG and sustainability reporting, there's a million different ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. They are starting probably over the next two, three, four years to move towards a single global set of agreed metrics. As there is with accounting, there is a set of international financial reporting standards. Everybody in the world uses them. Everybody knows what they mean. There's consistently consistency and commonality. From an ESG point of view, we're not there yet, mm -hmm. but we need to get there so that investors can make comparisons. Mm -hmm. Employees can judge, is this better than that? So it's going to take some time, yeah. but it's a work in progress. So in the ESG field, at least in Vietnam, uh, in a lot of ways, KPMG is... Uh, trying to be and, and, and can be and will be uh, pioneers for it or, or is currently one. Um, how, how about helping the clients? How, how are you helping them to adapt? Maybe at a high level you can share um, some stories about uh, clients adapting kind of the ESG principles as well. Yeah, and, and I think you know, one of the things that's happening from an ESG point of view, and, and this is very important for Vietnamese businesses to understand, is it's not just about climate change. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously you know, COP26, climate change, the warming of the planet, rising, all that stuff is very immediate and very relevant. But businesses need to look at their own business model. What is it that they're doing? How are they doing it? How are they interacting with stakeholders? And how do they then measure whether they're a good business? So businesses who are looking at their supply chain, one of the things that many of our clients are doing is Vietnam is a key component of global manufacturing businesses. Mm -hmm. So people like Samsung, mm -hmm. you know, they don't manufacture for domestic consumption, they manufacture for global consumption. And they need to understand what global consumers need and expect. And increasingly global consumers are looking at the entirety of a business's supply chain. Mm -hmm. So they're not looking at it and saying, you know, ABC brand, you're fantastic in America, we love you because you do great things. They're looking at it saying, but where do you get your product from? Mm -hmm. And where do the components that go into that product come from? And who manufactures the, manu the packaging used to put that in there? And we have to go all the way through that supply chain. Mm -hmm. And what we're starting to do is to help businesses here help their supply chain change. Yeah. So, you know, Vietnamese manufacturers who have perhaps had less than wonderful ESG goals themselves, mm -hmm. if they want to stay part of a global supply chain, win new customers, win outsourced manufacturing arrangements, if they've got great policies around labour, around environment, mm -hmm. if they can demonstrate good governance, I'm going to buy product from them. Mm -hmm. So we're helping businesses the initial work is around helping them understand why this is important from a business perspective. It's not about charity. It's not about just protecting the environment. It's about making a business sustainable in the long term. If they don't do that, they're not going to survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, survival is one thing. And I mentioned earlier how the bottom line could be affected. Yep. I'd love to hear kind of what are your pitches to the clients and what, or what are your team's pitches to the clients as well? when they bring that up, like how do you approach that potential concern for them, um, both short term and long term? It, it, it's a real challenge. Mm. Um, and you know, Vietnamese business people mm -hmm. are, are pretty good at how they manage their money. They're mm -hmm. not gonna spend a dollar unless they think there is a dollar's return there. Mm -hmm. The challenge with some of the ESG is that it's a more holistic change to the valuation of a business. Mm -hmm. So if I, change my raw material supplier. I might finish up paying more for my raw materials. Mm -hmm. I may need a longer lead time before I place those orders. So you look at the P&L for that year, I've actually spent more money. Mm -hmm. 
But if you look at what new customers that brings next year, if you look at um, how many people are being employed by that new supplier, creating jobs where there weren't jobs before, employing people who perhaps would not have had those chances of employment before. What it comes down to then is how does the business communicate those changes? If it's a change in cost, you show someone the P&L. Mm. If it's a change in some of the ESG factors, it's a much more story-based to begin with because until someone wants to buy that business in the future at a higher multiple, it isn't immediately obvious from the P&L. So what we're doing with, with businesses is building a story that helps the owners and the management understand why it makes a difference in the long term. But it's difficult because we're asking people to spend money today. Mm. There is an immediate return there. Yep. And it's certainly not necessarily a return that is directly linked to the money they spend and what they spend it on. Yeah, well, I, I would add to that too, just given my own experience, um, especially um, now that Vietnam is more than ever becoming integrated into the global economy. Um, and that's, that trend will accelerate uh, as these Vietnamese companies or, or global ones to get more global customers these will be requirements and, and maybe we're not seeing them now because the, the surge of companies is not quite there yet. Like I, I use the example for every 100 international companies that have already launched in let's say a market like China or Japan or Korea, only 10 of them are in Vietnam. Yep. I, I, if I had to put like a, just throw a dart on the, on the board kind of thing. And of those 90 that will be here over the next five years, their likelihood of requirements for ESG related um, requirements will be higher than ever. So these companies need to be ready for that. Yeah, so, and yeah. Let me, I mean, the direct example I alluded to this earlier, we measure how much, how many training hours we give to people. Mm. Now, it would be easy for KPMG to make more profit if we didn't invest as much money in our learning and development programs. Mm -hmm. We save a bucket load of money. Yeah. But in three years' time, my people are not as good as our competitors' people. Mm -hmm. We can't recruit bright people to come and work for us because they say, where's my career development? Where are my learning opportunities? Mm -hmm. So we may spend more on training than other organizations, but that does translate to better client satisfaction, better people satisfaction, greater opportunities to recruit staff, greater reputation in the marketplace as being a good brand. Mm -hmm. That would never exist if we didn't invest in our people. You've got to get, you don't want to over-invest, but you do need to understand that you're making investments today that have a tangential benefit one, two, three years out. Right, yeah. And and, and retention of talent, that's another uh, growing issue. I think before COVID, um, all these new manufacturers moving to Vietnam are like, wow, there's an abundance of affordable labor, but that's quickly changing. Um, it's it's Well, one, it's becoming more expensive. Well, obviously, there's still great talent here, so... That's not a huge issue, but retention. I think, um, especially on the lower end manufacturing level, um, you see the, the labor demand is is moving towards higher tech manufacturing. That's yep. where the salaries are, and uh, companies that are investing in that, they're prepared to invest in that L and D. And if, if you're not, you're going to be lagging behind that. So. And companies who are prepared to invest not mm -hmm. just in their employees, but in the communities where those employees are from. Mm. So companies that say, I'm going to set up a manufacturing facility in a particular part of Vietnam. I'm going to engage with the community there. I'm going to have community outreach programs. I'm going to support cultural issues that that community has to deal with. Mm. Those sorts of investments build trust in that community. If I'm working for a company like that, I'm more likely to stay because they're good people. Mm -hmm. And if some company down the road offers me an extra $100,000 a month, I'll think, oh, well, yes, that's important, but I want to be here mm -hmm. because this company cares about me, it cares about my family, it cares about my community. So you know, investment in outreach programs for companies, again, is not, it's not just uh, a charity thing. It's a business imperative that if you are not accepted by your community, you're not going to be sustainable and successful. Mm -hmm. KPMG, I mean, this approach is localized, of course. Um, but at the global level, uh, what, are, what are some of the mandates from the global level that you, you guys are receiving 
and 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 then localizing here. Would you say? Yeah, look, a, a lot of work being done at a at a global level. Um, the big things are around decarbonisation. Mm. How are companies changing their business models to become less carbon bad? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> unfriendly. <laughs> unfriendly. Um, you know, to either reduce their, their carbon footprint. You know, look, in a number of markets, there are various carbon trading schemes and offset schemes. Mm. And, you know, but what it's really about is how do companies change their business models to be better citizens. Mm -hmm. It's looking at, we do a lot of work here in the renewable sector, mm -hmm. helping companies invest in solar, helping companies invest in hydro. So we're helping people find those opportunities. And again, from a, from a KPMG point of view, we're still providing tax advice. We're still providing strategy advice. We're still providing technology services and audit services, but it's to businesses who are looking to change how they work. And that's where we're starting to do a lot of a lot of things. So globally, decarbonisation is big, and now Vietnam's got net zero commitments leading out to 2020, 2040, 2050, mm -hmm. removing as much of the coal as we possibly can over the next 25 years. But there's work to be done about what do we do with those coal assets? Mm -hmm. It's easy to say let's build a new solar farm, but and it's easy to say stop the coal but people are employed in those coal businesses. Those coal businesses have got lots of capital tied up in them. So there's work to be done, not just with the promotion of new technologies, but also as a country, how do we manage the cessation and the wind down of some of those businesses? You can't just lock it up and sack everybody. Mm -hmm. That's not the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah. Electric vehicles, huge area uh, globally, and obviously you know, that's starting to become an issue in Vietnam. There are electric vehicles here, not so much, many electric charging places to mm -hmm. charge your vehicles. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of work being done around transport, a lot of work being done in the renewable sector. Uh, we do a lot of work in governance, which is not the sexy part of ESG, mm -hmm. but it's about helping companies to be better governed, mm -hmm. having good people on your boards, having smart people on your boards, mm -hmm. having diversity on your boards. You know, again, if we look at Vietnam 10 years ago, boards of companies were fairly predictable. They would have been Vietnamese guys between 40 and 55 and a number of Vietnamese women of the same age bracket. Mm -hmm. But not too many significant Vietnamese companies had 25-year-old Vietnamese people on their board mm -hmm. or had an expert in a particular subject on the board or had technology people involved. If you bring that diversity to your board and to your management team, you're going to generate new ideas, you're going to create better opportunities, and you're going to be a better business. Mm. I, I see that happening, especially with uh, the so-and-so called uh, F2 generation. Have you heard about this term? It's like the... the I'm, it's, sorry, I, I'm from a different generation. Oh, sure, and there's sure, so sure. many generations have come since me. So. Right, right, right. Yeah, there. I mean, there's a lot of different uh, terms that, to put it, but basically the 20, 30-somethings, um, uh, kids basically of the family businesses are now in process or will be taking over family businesses as well. So we're a bit of an organic process, I yeah. guess you could say, of injecting fresh thinking because, you know, families like to keep things within the families, I guess you could say, right? And some of these are now, some of these kids are uh, now the age of to take over the family businesses. Yeah, so. and I think that's, that's incredibly important in Vietnam mm. at the moment because, again, when I came here, the private sector was in a nascent stage. It was the early 90s. We were just starting to open the economy. A lot of the people who started the businesses at that time, they're now my age and older. They're late 50s, 60s. They're looking to either exit the business or transition the business. Mm. Often their children have got some level of overseas education, got some different experience. That transition away from the traditional family model where everybody who is in a leadership position is there because they're close to the family, right. that's changing. Mm. And it's interesting, I was looking at a, a company yesterday with some of our folks, and they've just got an eclectic group of people involved. Mm -hmm. There's advisors involved, there's a board involved, there's management involved. They've got some really smart people. Mm -hmm. They're gonna come up with some great ideas. Mm -hmm. And many of them um, are from overseas too, in the sense that, you know, I was talking to, for instance, my friend who's an executive at an e-commerce company here, and, and she was telling me that e-commerce, huge business now, obviously, in Vietnam. 
but could you find somebody in Vietnam that has 15 years of search experience? It would be kind of hard, would be difficult. But yeah. there are people that are of a Vietnamese background too, actually, that have worked at the likes of Amazon in the US for 15 years and have that experience. So I think also the attraction of the destination of being, um, or Vietnam being a destination of a great place to work is also helping feed that that talent stream, I would say. That's you know. certainly, a, I'll be honest, that's a challenge in the ESG space. Mm. Um, there isn't a lot of Vietnamese people here in Vietnam mm -hmm. who've got direct experience with biodiversity, mm -hmm. with decarbonisation, because it hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. And again, it's the same sort of thing that we're looking at. How do we get capability that knows what it's doing to work with our clients here? Mm -hmm. It's hard to recruit locally. Uh, we're setting up centres of excellence. We're pulling resource from... Taiwan, Japan, India, Australia, Malaysia, from markets where there is that experience saying, come back and, and help us build that capability locally. Oh, amazing. A lot of companies have used the centers of excellence term. Maybe you can elaborate on that. Is yeah. that are these like internal knowledge hubs where you bring experts and you, you also train, you know, the 250 new trainees coming in about, about that topic? What is that? Looks different like exactly. different companies use them differently. Mm -hmm. from, a, from an ESG perspective, mm -hmm. we're setting up uh, for instance, a decarbonisation hub. Mm. And what we're saying is because there is a limited pool of really bright people mm. who are expensive to hire, if we put them in a single location and we make that centre available to other KPMG teams, mm. that's a great way to demonstrate to the market we've got the knowledge. It's a great way to build local capability through those interactions. Mm. But if I employed in Vietnam today an expert in a certain field, I probably couldn't keep them busy enough for the full year to justify mm. doing that. But if KPMG in Vietnam, KPMG in Cambodia, and Laos and Thailand has got access to a pool of talent that we can call on, mm -hmm. who exists mm. to help us and support us, it's a great way to go forward. Excellent. So those hubs are being built here, right here in Ho Chi Minh City? Not too no. many of the ESG ones Not are being yet. built in okay. Ho Chi Minh City. Um, in time, mm. we're building, we provide uh, in the technology enablement area, mm -hmm. we've got some great people in our practice here who have got significant SAP and Oracle experience. Mm. We're providing resource and expertise to KPMG in Australia. Mm. So, you know, in certain areas, we have capability here. Mm. That's because we started building it a number of years ago exactly. and investing in it. In the ESG area, not so much here locally. But you have at the access moment. from overseas to, to bring those capabilities Correct. in. Okay. Yeah. Well, excellent. That's the strength of KPMG, right? Global network. So. Well, I, look, I think it's a, it's a strength of any global organization that leverages its globalness. Mm -hmm. And you know, we work very hard to be very Vietnamese, mm -hmm. but to leverage the great things about being mm -hmm. part of a global network that employs. 230,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, some of those 230,000 are going to be pretty bright. They're all living the same values we live mm -hmm. around together for better, excellence. So, yeah, there's a great sense of camaraderie. There's a great sense of collaboration. And the great thing for Vietnam is it's a fantastic market. Mm -hmm. You know, I was looking at the papers the other day, and when you've got Tim Cook saying Vietnam's a great country, that's a good story, and we're a part of it. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Um, my, my last question about the ESG topic for you, John, would be about um, how the narrative has changed after uh, the, the, the pandemic, um, or the worst part of it. How has ESG's strategy for KPMG adapted to that? Has it changed at all? Has it, um, and, and if so, what, what changes are those? The pandemic showed very clearly that no business, no community, no mm -hmm. country exists in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. It highlighted the importance of governments collaborating with businesses, collaborating with communities. It highlighted how important taking care of the people who live in a country really is. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it's a, if there are good things that come out of bad situations, it has accelerated the understanding of why this stuff is super important and is not just a theoretical discussion around ESG that's had in developed markets. 
what it has highlighted is that if businesses focus on what keeps them sustainable, mm -hmm. what keeps them mm -hmm. good, what keeps them being trusted and respected, if they invest in those areas, they'll come out of it okay. Mm -hmm. So I think what's really come out of COVID, it hasn't changed our ESG strategy that much. I think it's made it a lot more real for people who were not necessarily believers before. Mm. And that's a great thing. It's not throwing a wrench in their plans and then <laughs> in well, a good it, sense, it's it, a it's highlighted, forced adaptation. Yeah, you know, businesses struggled. They needed their employees to go the extra mile, to be prepared to live on site, mm -hmm. to be prepared to come back to work, mm -hmm. to be prepared to do things that they might not normally do. If you hadn't mm -hmm. been looking after your people, they just up and left and they haven't come back. Same with businesses, restaurants, etc. Ones that struggled, ones that closed. If they had had great customer service, if they produce good quality product, mm -hmm. if it was somewhere you wanted to go because it was good, mm -hmm. you go back there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, look, I, it hasn't changed our strategy around ESG or our internal metrics, but it's given us some great stories to talk to about what businesses have done well mm -hmm that resonates with business people, that they understand isn't immediate P&L focused, but they now know they've got to do things. Mm. John, we're, we're nearing the end of our show here today. Uh, a lot of ESG sharings, a lot about you and your time in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I, I always like to end the show and, and you mentioned 250 new recruits have joined KPMG in, in the upcoming batch in the fall. Um, is your team hiring? You, know, you mentioned the centers of excellence are, are, are global in nature and they come to Vietnam. Uh, what are you building in terms of your capabilities of ESG at KPMG and who would you like to, to bring to your team? Yeah, look, it's interesting because um, I don't like to say that we provide ESG services because mm. it makes it look as if ESG is something different. Mm. KPMG provides tax services. We provide audit. We pro have a great legal firm. We do a lot of work in the deal space. We're looking to make ESG a watermark that runs through every part of our business. Mm -hmm. So our audit business provides assurance around financial statements. What will happen is that our audit business will start to provide in time assurance around non-financial metrics, mm -hmm. around carbon numbers, around social factors. So you know, we're working really hard to educate all of our staff across the entire firm mm -hmm. to be aware of ESG issues, to have intelligent conversations with their clients around what our clients are doing. And, you know, if we're doing some work, we're doing some due diligence, mm -hmm. for instance, on a solar plant. Traditionally, we've done finance due diligence and tax and legal. We're now looking to say, well, hang on, what about some environmental and social? What are we doing with um, the waste from those? How do we treat the water that we use and the detergents we use to clean all the all those cells so it's our new graduates understanding that they are esg consultants and auditors or their esg consultants and tax advisors mm -hmm. or their esg consultants and their lawyers but it's not something that sits outside or different to our business. Okay, it. It's something we do across the business. It's a, it's a layer on top of everything you do already. It so. is a watermark that runs through the business is the term we use. In that case, for those of you wondering about working at KPMG, that's what you'll get. You'll get some great L&D about ESG from John himself. <laughs> you'll, get, you'll, you'll get a great experience. I mean, yeah, one of, the, one of the things I love about working at KPMG is um, every year we have hundreds of bright young people join us mm -hmm. and Let's be honest, they don't all stay, mm. but they all go on to have great careers. And if they take their values and if they take their behaviours and if they take the desire to make a difference with them, that's fulfilling our purpose of inspiring confidence and empowering change. Mm. Not doing it necessarily all as KPMG, but doing it through everybody we interact with. That's why I get up and come to work every day. Fantastic. For those listening in, if you'd like to get up and go to work every day as excited as John, do uh, follow up on this podcast, reach out to him and join his team at KPMG Vietnam. 
For those of you listening in today, thank you so much for another episode of Vietnam Innovators. Our guest, John Diddy, the head of ASG and a partner at KPMG Vietnam. John, thank you for joining the show. Fantastic. Thanks for having me. It's great to sort of reach out to people that I might yes. not normally connect with. Yeah, exactly. Really enjoyed it. Fantastic. And and hopefully for those of you listening and you've learned a little bit about ESG, KPMG in Vietnam. And if you have any questions, just drop them in the comments. You can always reach out to us or, of course, anyone at KPMG. John, thank you so much. We hope to welcome you or, or anyone else at KPMG on the show again soon and hear about the progress made on ESG. I'd love to keep track on that. Um, until next time. Thank you. Very good. Thanks, guys. See you next time. Entering the Vietnamese market since 1994, KPMG is one of the largest professional service firms in the country with over 1,800 experts serving international and local clients in a wide range of industries. Recognized for its excellent auditing and tax services, KPMG has also since expanded to other services such as legal, deal consulting, and business consulting.